Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and today I'm going to tell you what I have been reading during quarantine and this is kind of like a March wrap up but also kind of not because it's only the second half of March because I've already told you about all the things I read in the first half and then also the quarantine has been affecting my reading because of lack of access to the library and also the stress has been affecting how I interact with books. If you were to go look at my Goodreads you would see that I am currently reading seven books. A couple of these I haven't touched in a couple of months but like five of them I am actually currently reading uh, because for some reason the stress is making it difficult to settle into a certain book and I just keep switching back and forth to different books um, and starting new ones before I finish the old ones which is very much not my style. A few of these I read before I started doing that and I actually read them all at once uh, but several of them were juggles at the end and there are several that I've been reading at the same time as these last few that I'm still not done with. So it's been a very weird time and I'm going to start out with three that I read more normally and that kind of feel like a set to me because I read them in a different time mentally than the others and also because my expectations of how I would like them were all wrong. So these are The Gilded Wolves by Roshani Chakshi, My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich by Ibi Zaboy, and This is What It Feels Like by Rebecca Barrow. And two of these, these two I got from a uh, Kwanzaa Reflectathon video by The Book Cave. Uh, Yvette, I think, is her name. And I just found three different books, widely different books, uh, that I wanted to read from there. They just all happened to come in from my library right before my library closed. <laughs> but I actually finished The Gilded Wolves first. And I've seen a lot of things about this. I saw more about it longer ago. Like I think it came out a while ago and there was some buzz about it then but then it kind of like fell off people's radar I think. But then Noria Reads brought it up recently and the things that she said about it actually made me finally want to read it. She focused a lot on the found family aspects and talked a lot about how great all the characters are and their relationships with each other and so I was very excited to read this and I expected <laughs> that I would either love it or hate it uh, based on that it was a medium popular YA and I kind of had an inkling that there was some unhappiness in it so I thought either it would be this totally awesome book that I would totally love and I uh, would love all the characters and their interactions or it would be a really classic over dramatic, sad YA uh, who also had likable characters but that, that didn't make up for it. But in the end I ended up with really mixed feelings uh, that were to neither pole. As I was reading it I was really happy because I also <laughs> really loved all the relationships between the characters. It is about a found family of teenagers from I think the youngest ones are 16 up to uh, 18, though the oldest one might actually be 19. Anyway, it is a group of genius thieves who go on various heists to recover magical artifacts that have been basically stolen by this evil secret society. Um, and they're not necessarily returning them to their owners. A few things they've taken back to their rightful owners, but mostly they just steal the things and then sell them. And so they're kind of rich. And the main, main character, because we get to see through this perspectives of all the, I think, six members of the little group. The main main character is called Severin and he has bought a hotel with all the money that he's made from stealing things and uh, that's where he and his little group lives in part of the hotel and his love interest named Layla is like this super amazing dancer who called L'Enigma. I can't speak French. The Enigma, who is like super famous <laughs> and amazing and everybody loves her and she wears a mask so people don't know her identity. Another member of this crew is a explosives slash chemistry type stuff expert. She is Jewish and she became part of the group when she got kicked out of a school for, I think, chemists for blowing things up. And another member is a half Filipino, half Spanish boy, and he is an expert on all things history, and specifically the history of magical objects and this secret society. And then another member is the adoptive brother of Severin, who is an expert with plants, and 
there's this power called forging where you can kind of it's a type of magic that involves creating things from other things and he has plant magic the explosives girl named Zofia uh, has metallurgy type magic which is what she uses to explode things and she also makes things like masks and she's kind of the inventor for the group who gives them all their what are they called? Gadgets. She creates gadgets. And so it's this little group of supposedly super brilliant, amazing people. And it is addressed somewhat that they lack common sense to make up for the fact that they're brilliant in these other ways. But there's also an aspect where the author is describing them as being very brilliant and wonderful. And then actually in the pages of the book, they do some really stupid things. And also supposedly at the beginning of the story, they have been stealing stuff from these rich, very powerful people for quite a while, for two years. And most of them have been together for that long. And they've just been pulling off all these amazing things for this long, not getting caught. And then they do really stupid things the moment they come across the slightly smart villains in this book and are caught really easily by the bad guys. So that part's a little weird and irritated me right off the bat because the main story kicks off with the main main character Severin being tricked into a contract where he has to help this other person steal something and the way he's tricked into it is he's an idiot. He falls for the same guy's bluff within a five minute conversation. He got bluffed into joining this conversation and admitting that he had stolen something from this person. And then five minutes later in the same conversation, the guy who wants him to do something bluffs again and Severin falls for it and enters into the contract before he can check that the guy is bluffing or not. So that was irritating. <laughs> but later on, it was easy to focus just on the relationships between the characters and how interesting all of them were individually, rather than focusing on the actual plot, because the plot part was where it fell down for me. The character who actually does the bluffing and the tricking Severin into helping him is actually one of my favorite characters. <laughs> and I really identify with his whole attitude of, please let me into your little group of misfits. No one else will be friends with me. <laughs> And I actually liked Severin the least of all these characters. What was I going to say? Uh, Zofia, by the way, turned out to be my favorite favorite uh, because she is autistic. It isn't put on the page, but she's very much um, portrayed as someone with autistic characteristics. And then I found out later on that it has been confirmed, I believe, by the author, but it's on official lists of books with autistic representation. So I was really pleased with that and I really enjoyed the way that she was portrayed. It felt really accurate to me and I felt seen <laughs> even though the author herself is apparently not autistic or if she is it's not public so she probably just did really good research and I appreciate that. I felt really emotional and unhappy at the ending and I can do pretty well without spoiling this but if you don't like even vague spoilers skip ahead to the time code for the next book which will be in the description. But basically it wrapped up the individual plot of this book really well and nicely and it was all finished and taken care of and then it sort of instead of just ending it there and letting us buy the next book so that we could learn more about these characters and have more fun with them it decided to basically start the plot for the next book by ripping apart everything by just really messing up everything and all the relationships between the characters so that we can look forward to them getting fixed in the next book I guess. It, it could have just chopped off when the plot was done and everything was resolved to my satisfaction <laughs> at the end of this book and then we could have had all the upsetting things happen at the beginning of the next book and then you know dealt been, been able to like read the fixing of the problems at the same time we realized there were problems. Would not would that have been so terrible? But no, gotta convince people to read the next book by making them unhappy. Rude. <laughs> but I will probably read the next books anyway because I really did love the characters, but rude. Also very standard nowadays for books and series. <sighs> but I really like books that just have episodic storytelling where they reach a conclusion and then you read the next book because you enjoyed the first book, not because you're nervous and have things unresolved from the first one. Anyway, liked it anyway. But these next two, I also had expectations that were not accurate. I expected them to be what they were and about what they were, 
but I didn't accurately predict <laughs> my feelings about that. So with this one, I thought I was going to absolutely love it and really enjoy reading it because it is about a little neurodivergent girl who has a lot of autistic traits and it's set in the 60s and 70s and it's just about her living her life as a neurodivergent. Uh, but I ended up <laughs> not disliking the book. It wasn't a bad book, but it was a very upsetting book, which I'll explain in a moment. This one, ah, just dropping things. This one I expected to only like a little bit because it is a YA contemporary about some members of a band. And the way it was described, I don't remember if Yvette described it this way or if I read this in the description somewhere else but it seemed like it was going to be very dramatic and just about very normal things with no magic or other interesting things going on but I wanted to read it just because she said it was good <laughs> but I thought it wouldn't be specifically to my taste but this was actually my favorite of the three I read it in one and a half days I think and it was just so pleasant. It actually takes place after some drama has occurred between three friends and their friendship and at the same time their band has broken up because of drama between them but this is actually the story of them getting back together and repairing those relationships and dealing with all the stuff that's gone wrong in their lives and recovering from it and it's so uplifting both in uh, the valuing of female platonic relationships and also just everything getting better for these characters all the time and it dealt with some heavy topics but the whole time it was also much like uh the story life of aj fickrey it brought them around and used them to lift these characters up and show how they dealt positively with the negative things in their life it's hard to describe it more than that one of the girls in the group of friends is a lesbian and there is a sweet female female romance in this with another girl outside the group and it's just really pleasant all the way through. The reason that this one was not so pleasant is that it's basically just a little neurodivergent girl being bullied by her parents and everyone around her the entire way through and they never stop or learn from their mistakes. She's the one who learns to adjust to them better, which is generally the opposite of what neurodivergent people need to hear because they hear it from everybody all the time and usually in regular society neurotypical people are never told that they need to meet us halfway. I agree we need to meet neurotypical people halfway but the message that came through in this book was that we need to meet them but they don't need to meet us. It was weird for a, a book about neurodivergence and you could take it as that's more subtext but and I enjoyed the representation because she does show a lot of autistic traits specifically but also just not fitting in that whole thing and I like that her specific weird thing uh, her special interest is uh, Star Trek or space in general but specifically uh, sci-fi related to space. She's more into the fictional aspects than actual space science but she likes actual space science too. So I identified with that a lot but the the parents were just horrible trying to make her fit in. Just let your little kid pretend she's in a rocket ship instead of playing hopscotch and what was it they were playing? Jump rope but there's two of them. Like, normal kids, when they're interested in different things, normal, I mean kids who behave properly as they should and aren't little jerks, kids who aren't jerks, who are interested in two different things and aren't that interested in other things that their friends want to play with, take turns where you shoot a bottle rocket and then you play jump rope and then you go watch Star Trek and then you go watch a regular movie. It's not that complicated. It's not, it's not that hard to not be a jerk to people who have different interests than you. And I get the little kids on the block not getting that by themselves, but I don't get the parents reinforcing, no, you have to be interested in the specific exact thing that everybody else on the, on the block is interested in or you can't have any friends. It was a very frustrating book, but I can't really tell if the author was agreeing with that or if she was just having the parents say that because that's what neurotypicals sometimes do. The next two things I'm going to review in a group were two audiobooks. The first one was Every Hotter Doorway, which as I said before was supposed to come in for the Femme Van Tale readathon, 
but didn't so I just read it after that and it is a portal fantasy but where you as the reader don't actually get to go through the portals you just hear people talk about the various worlds that are on the other side of the portals because it is also like this series here kind of in that individual children who are not doing so great in their own lives for whatever reason get tootle off to fairyland various different types of fairyland that are each specifically suited to that person but some of them are very much like this fairyland and some of them are totally different and they have like classifications of logical and uh, nonsense or evil or good and it's only a short little book the audiobook was about four and a half hours books that are like 350 pages are usually about eight to nine hours so this is a fairly short book and it was a fairly short concept and I think it was well contained in that length. Basically there is a school for all the children who have been taken off to these various types of fairyland and then have been sent back for whatever reason and then haven't been able to go back to their fairyland. They've become stuck in the regular world and they're not handling it very well. And so we stick with I think just the one perspective of our main character who is who is romantic but um asexual. I say just romantic instead of hetero or whatever because I can't remember what type she was, just that she liked a boy. But we start with her first getting introduced to this school and that is a nice way for us to be told about this school and all these organizations of different types of portal worlds and all these students because it's new to her so it's also natural to get explained to her and at the same time it can get explained to us and we meet some really interesting other characters who are taken off to these other worlds because for various reasons they did not fit in in the regular world and we get to learn about all their fun experiences fun and sometimes very dangerous and scary experiences in these other worlds and it's just fascinating but the main plot is about people starting to get murdered at this school and we are trying to solve the mystery of who's doing it and we get to meet a trans boy which is the boy that the main character likes and I like him quite a lot too and a girl who is super into the macabre she acts as the coroner in the case um the unofficial coroner because they don't want to call the police because the school could get shut down and she basically learned from a non-evil a Frankenstein type person in her portal world and she is just a very fun character and I really especially like the audiobook because the narrator did all the voices differently and I really liked the super flat voice <laughs> she used for this character. The murders were really really sad because I really identified with a lot of these characters because I cope with a lot of things by pretending that I can go off into these other worlds through a portal even though it's just through my imagination and I really identify with how distressing it would be if I was cut off from that. And so we get to actually learn the stories of the girls who were murdered but it was a little easier than it is sometimes because whenever it's an audiobook and not a print book I'm just a little more distant from it emotionally because something about the way my brain works taking in uh, audio information versus visual information and also that I can't just go back and read a little bit and skim back and check things and like savor things quite as much because it just keeps going on. I know I can pause it and run it back but it's just more effort than it is to flip back in a book. So I just experienced them differently and so those uh, painful losses didn't hurt me as much as they would in a print book probably. So I'm happy with that because overall I really really enjoy this book for the representation but also just for the really nice story and concept and world building. I guess The Murderer probably halfway through but that was just because I was assuming it based on how authors usually write murders in that they usually introduce you to the murderer fairly early on and so I knew it was one of about 10 characters that we actually knew but I don't mind being able to guess murderers I actually quite enjoy it. Then we have A Blade So Black which has a very cool cover. I can't remember who recommended it irritates me because I remember watching the video I just don't remember whose face was in it. This is a Alice in Wonderland inspired story and I say inspired rather than retelling because from what I remember of the plot of Alice in Wonderland or lack thereof I don't think this plot is 
in any way related to that. Basically, just the concept of Wonderland is there. The main character is named Alice, and there are a couple of characters lifted from the Wonderland stories, like the Red Queen and the White Queen, etc. In this story, Alice is a dreamwalker, and dreamwalkers are people who kill nightmares, which are physical incarnations of people's nightmares in the real world and they come from Wonderland which is like a dream world and she has a teacher who is teaching her how to be a dreamwalker. I'm not sure what his name is because it was an audiobook and they said Hatta but I can't tell if they were pronouncing Hatter with an English accent or what kind of name that is because I don't know if Hatta being a name but maybe it is and sometimes they called him Addison, which would have sounded like he was just his first and last name, except sometimes I thought I also heard it say Hatterson. So I don't actually know what his name is, but the everything else about the audiobook was really good. I really loved how she did the different accents, because she was doing American accents of various kinds. She did some Russian accents, she did an English accent, several English accents. She did a posh princess accent that was really funny. <laughs> so the narrator, whose name I can't remember, did an awesome job and I was able to listen to it at two times speed because she spoke so clearly despite doing all these accents and that was good because this was an almost 12 hour audiobook so about three times as long as Every Heart of Doorway. The plot was really complicated and I really liked that. I had been reading several books basically all the ones I just told you about that only had one thing going on in the plot and it was just the story of that one thing in a lot of detail but this was more of a epic fantasy type of tale where you have lots of different segments and like you solve this problem then another problem comes and you solve that and they're all interrelated but they also each have their own conclusion and I really enjoy that complicatedness sometimes sometimes I like the extra detail that going into one thing like the Gilded Wolves did but sometimes I also really like this more broad expanse and that covers a long time because it covers from when she first gets introduced to Wonderland as a and moves kind of fast until like when she's been working like this for a year but we actually do get to see some of that training and that introduction and then we get to see several different and then after that we get to see several full-fledged problems she deals with I just really enjoyed all the complicatedness and all the factors working on things I really love the world building the magic system is really cool she has uh, magic daggers that she uses to kill the nightmares and because of how Wonderland is a dream world she can actually meet up with other dreamwalkers and help them and them help her defeat nightmares from across the world. So that's where the Russians come in. They aren't people who've moved from Russia to America. They're in Russia and we just meet them in the dream world and there are quite a few characters like nine good team characters and they're all really easy to keep track of because they were introduced so gradually and enough detail was given about each of them and they're all distinct enough so i really enjoyed the wide cast of characters and how different they all were while still being really cool and good guys the bad guy even at the end of the book we don't know that much about <laughs> history wise and his was one voice that the narrator did that i didn't like because it was that weird slimy I can't I can't imitate it you know where those creepy charming villains the voices they use I hate those um, so while it made it easier to hate him it was also kind of nailed on a chalkboard for me fortunately he doesn't have that much dialogue and there is also a really cute very much on the sidelines very much side characters and it's not brought up a whole lot but there is a very very cute female female romance that is <laughs> basically one of my favorite tropes which is a knight who is the specific protector of the monarch with the monarch so that just just the icing on the cake <laughs> for me really enjoying this story but the weird part is that I was listening to that at the same time I was listening to Binti and the girl who drank the moon and I'm also reading the second book in the Pandora series and since I finished this one I've also been reading monster she wrote which is a bunch of profiles of female horror writers back when the genre was first getting started and so like 
Uh, I haven't finished any of those, but I've just been switching between these ones that I've finished now and those ones, and it just felt so weird, and I don't think I connected with a, a lot of these as much as I would have if I'd been reading them one at a time. But the other books that I've been reading while listening to A Blade So Black was Swastika Night, and I read this, and... Gathering Blue for End of the World Week, which was a readathon which is hosted by Claudia from Spinster's Library because she is really into classics and also dystopia. So this is a readathon focused on 20th century dystopia, so anything from 1900 to 1995, I think. And so this one was published in 1937, which was a few years before World War II, but it's called Swastika Night because at that time the author, Catherine Burdekin, was an English person who had heard about Nazism and Hitler and was going on in Germany and was very concerned and was like, what would happen if he took over the world? The vast majority of this 200 and some pager is, uh, is dialogue, so um, there's only a little bit of plot to it and it's less like an arc of something happening and getting resolved than just Da, da 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 life going on and something happens but things aren't that much different at the end than at the beginning but basically this is set 700 years later where culture and such has evolved a lot but technology hasn't at all so I guess she just wasn't interested at all in sci-fi and didn't bother to put any of that in because most other people who set dystopias that far in the future like the Hunger Games uh, technology has also evolved, but she was very much just interested in cultural and national and political stuff going on, so that's just all she wrote about because she couldn't be bothered, which is understandable. She originally wrote this under a masculine pen name because very little respect was given to anything, especially philosophical thought, by women in those times. Not so great in these times either, but a little bit better, but uh, one of the things that sets her society apart from some others is that it is very much focused on how sexism would affect society if it was taken to an extreme and in a lot of ways attempts to show men <laughs> how if you keep degrading women it will eventually blow up in your face because at this point supposedly women have gotten so discouraged that they keep themselves from having girl babies, which I don't think is how science works, but it's not a science fiction. It's a philosophical thought and it's mostly a rhetorical situation. But it also looks at a lot of other things like how treating pe other people like they are less makes them less. Uh, and specifically she was talking about in her world, Germans had made English people and all other nationalities feel like they were less so that they wouldn't rise up against the Germans who had conquered half the world and uh, Japan has conquered the other half. And through the dialogue of two men, an Englishman and a German, she argues about what effect this has on the empire as a whole and how it makes the English people less valuable as a subject race, I believe is what she calls them. And she also does a lot of addressing how conquerors and people who want to oppress people will destroy history so that they can put in place their own history and they destroy sources of information like books and monuments and carvings and paintings so that their narrative will be the only narrative and about how if you take all these things away, culture will no longer exist, and if culture no longer exists, there can be no more art because people have no inspiration coming from art of the past, and just a lot of interesting things like that, and she brings it back around to the women a lot because she's uh, understandably mostly concerned with that, and so I enjoyed a lot of what she had to say. I skimmed some bits where it was mainly concerned with uh, philosophical concepts other than the ones I've mentioned because I thought they were boring, but I would definitely recommend it, uh, especially if you would like to study more classic uh, feminist thought and see dystopian from a woman's point of view. Because as Claudia mentioned in some of her videos, a lot of dystopians written by men feature equality between the sexes in this horrible dystopian society, because apparently that's a bad thing. 
Which brings me to the other book that I read for this readathon, which was Gathering Blue. Actually, let me tell you about The Giver while I'm at it, because I haven't told you about that yet. I read The Giver back in January, and I just never brought it up because it didn't fit into any of my videos I was making. But basically, it was a dystopia that was written quite a while ago, sometime in the 20th century. <laughs> but it is a classic, and it's got awards. In fact, I'll put a clip in because I did a little vlog segment on that. So I'm only 15 pages into The Giver, uh, but I'm already checking in because I already have thoughts. You were immediately plonked down in this super creepy community, is what it's called, and there are references to other communities, but like, you're also right away introduced to people getting executed, basically, is what it seemed, and it's referred to as being released, and you're kicked out of the community, and it sounds like you die when this happens. And so it, it's quite creepy and quite a regimented society, it already looks like. All the families do the same thing, all the families have the same amount of members, all the babies are taken care of by groups of people rather than individual families, and you're assigned to a marriage. You don't, you know, do the falling in love thing, you're assigned because it's thought that you... I don't know, some kind of a matchmaking service. Anyway, forced matchmaking. Uh, but anyway, there's the, besides that, which quite frankly, the world building in the first 15 pages that it got all of that across was quite good. But the part that's wearing me out is how the children are acting because there's a seven year old and then the main character is an 11 year old. He has a seven year old sister. And uh, the seven year old is acting kind of weird. Like I get that she's supposed to be brainwashed but there's this thing that they do at night, which is called feelings talk or something, where you all talk about the feelings you had during the day, which would be a really healthy thing to do if it wasn't so ridiculously regimented. Except that the seven-year-old acted really weird with it, because um, she had gotten angry at somebody at the schoolyard that day, and she explained that, and then her family went around and explained how he had probably was confused because he was visiting from another community and he probably felt awkward and it wasn't his fault he was misbehaving and cutting in the line. And the seven-year-old accepted that and was like, yeah, I'm sorry you got angry about it at him now. And I'm like, have you met a seven-year-old? I've met a very large number. They don't have that kind of emotional maturity. It wasn't even just her taking their word for it. She was like processing that with their help and it was like, no. <laughs> so how cooperative the seven-year-old was really like <laughs> broke my brain. So I'm, uh, I wanted to get that thought out before I went on reading and like turned my mind to other things because I had a lot of thought about that. So uh, I'm going to keep reading and see if it makes a little bit more sense further in. And other things about The Giver that irritated me were that the little family unit that the main character is a part of, the dad is a caregiver to infants. He goes and like takes care of them at a group place and the mom is a judge. And that would be great <laughs> it was in a normal book that was showing that that was a normal and great thing. But it's a dystopia, and I'm pretty sure the author thought that was not a normal and great thing. And he was trying to use gender roles to show you that this is a creepy society where things are wrong. <laughs> so that really irritated me. Other than that, very creepy, but in a much gentler and softer way than a lot of dystopias. Nobody's murdering people in plain sight and nobody is made to live like a subspecies in plain sight. It's all more hidden away better than that. But I liked the somewhat hopeful ending and I thought that the next book would pick up right from there and see what happened next to our protagonist because things have changed for him quite a lot. But Gathering Blue is actually about a different part of the society, actually a separate society that exists apart from the community that the giver slash the receiver were a part of. And hers is very different, it is a lot less technologically advanced, people are much more separated into castes rather than just by their job. People aren't assigned families, but all the families are really, really horrible. Pretty much abusive both emotionally and um, verbally and physically across the board. The main character's family doesn't fit into that. I don't know where her mom and dad learned not to be horrible. But anyway, she has been without a father uh, since she was very young, but her mother has been supportive and kind for all her life and taught her how to embroider and sew 
when her mother dies of a mysterious sudden illness that doesn't affect anyone else, she gets taken to live in the big old church, which is very clearly described as a Christian church without using those words because the history has been erased once again. And she is told to embroider uh, the singer's robes because the singer is the keeper of the fake history and he wears robes embroidered with the history. And so she is considered sufficiently specially skilled to come and live in this nice church and have servants and everything she needs and uh, indoor plumbing and be separated from the lower castes. And so we get to learn about this other dystopian society that exists, I believe in the same world and at the same time, I think the last book is gonna bring them all together because the third book I've also read the start of and it features yet another child in another society. And I don't think they're all unrelated. I think they're related and are gonna come together, but I'm not sure. And so I like this one a lot more. It didn't have the whole gender roles are swapped, so that's creepy thing. It had gender roles more of the same, um, and it was almost equal in the amount of derision it had for the common man as for the common woman, but there were some some sexist things said uh, that weren't part of the dystopian society, but were the narrator describing them. So Lois Lowry is not, not the most unsexist of authors, but I am still interested in the other books. So that's what I've been reading lately. So thank you so much for watching. If you read any of these, I'd like to hear your thoughts. And if you haven't read them, but are interested in the concept, I'd love to hear about that too. Also, have your reading patterns also changed since the world got crazy? I've been talking to some people on Twitter about it, and apparently some other people have also been like picking up a bunch of different books at the same time and some people have been not reading at all because it makes them tired so thank you for hanging out with me i'll be seeing you in the next video bye